Today we're going to look at how to find the story in the data. Stepping back from that, we need to think about storytelling. Why is it that we're looking for the story? I've, I've run this workshop now with a, a number of organizations, client organizations and research organizations. And we always start with a session say about why are we interested in storytelling? Why has storytelling become the single biggest issue in how we communicate market research and insight results? And we tend to get the same things cropping up in that uh, shout out, have a discussion session as we're warming up for the workshop. Stories are more attention grabbing. Rather than just throwing individual facts, if we can use a story, we're likely to grab somebody's attention. More important than that, they're memorable. It's really hard to remember the kings and queens of England or the order of historical battles and all of these sorts of things. If we can weave the features into a story, then they become more memorable. It provides a coherent message because when we're talking about stories, we're not talking about postmodern stories where you can't understand what's going on. We're talking about old fashioned, real genuine stories, beginning, middle and end. And if you can't tell a good story, it probably means you don't have a coherent message. And if you can tell a good story, it means you do have a good coherent message. It's much easier to understand. The audience can anticipate where things are going. They're thinking ahead. They're fitting this into a reference network that they already have. They're understanding how this is all building together into a complete picture. But actually, more importantly than all of those, and this was a great comment that crops up probably about half the workshops that we run, it shows that we understand it. Because if you can't tell something as a straightforward story, it probably means you don't really understand it yourself. So, storytelling. Now, this is an interesting reflection on the change that's happened within the research industry within my lifetime. When I joined in the 1970s, we used to say, let the data speak for themselves because data was a plural, and we were seen as just the people processing the data. It was felt to be wrong to overinterpret the information or even really to interpret it. You should let the data speak for themselves. That does not work today. That is not relevant today. The data doesn't speak for itself. It's now a singular, and it certainly doesn't have a voice until we bring it alive. And anyway, it's only an intermediate step between the customers and the management who need to make decisions. It's not a thing of its own. It's simply an intermediate step. So we need to recognize that the data doesn't speak for itself. We need to interpret it. We need to craft a message. We have to ensure that at the end of the day, we are delivering impact to the business. So storytelling. Now, personally, I prefer the term narrative theme because storytelling has got a much, much wider history. And what we're trying to achieve is one particular feature where there is a clear narrative theme through what we're doing. So here is a narrative theme about describing our day. Wake, breakfast, travel, work, lunch, work, drinking, travel, sleep. Now, that particular narrative theme actually locates the story within certain situations. Within London, this is the theme because people live two or three hundred kilometers away from each other, a couple of hundred miles away from each other. They work in the center of London. Somebody goes north, somebody goes south. So you get a lifestyle where if you want to drink with your work colleagues or your friends who work in other similar companies, you do it after work before traveling home. I live in Nottingham in the north of the UK or the middle of the UK. The work pattern here is that you work, travel home, and then you go to visit your friends if you're going drinking or whatever. A different narrative. Now, if I ask you what you did yesterday, if I have two or three questions about what you did yesterday, it is much easier for you to put that into a sequence and then tell me back the answers in the sequence. That is what we do all the time. 
I used to coach a rugby team and we would talk about get changed, warm up, run, warm down, shower, get changed. Now, that was partly a narrative theme for description, but it was also because we wanted to instill warm up and warm down as part of that process. So the narrative theme is more than just a method of describing a story. It's a discipline for how we achieve things, and it's going to be a discipline for how we achieve stories and reporting of information. Here's an example of um, a real life piece of information that we want to communicate, and we're talking to about polio. We want to say about polio that it can be defeated, that we're getting really, really close to eradicating it. Now, how do we build that story up? We build that story up by talking about smallpox. Smallpox emerged about 10,000 years ago. In the 20th century, there were somewhere between 300 and 500 million deaths. It was one of the first diseases to be tackled by vaccination uh, using cowpox. The disease was de declared extinct in 1979, but it's only one of two that have so far been declared extinct. The other is rinderpest. So let's tackle some other diseases. Let's tackle polio. Now, the narrative theme I've used there is linear. And a lot of the time, we are going to use that linear narrative theme but we're going to pick particular features that are salient to a particular audience. How are we going to find this information to construct the story? Really, that's the key of today. And the answer is that you need to be using frameworks. Most teams that reliably produce good analysis and useful stories use frameworks. Now, we all know some people who are fantastic at analyzing data. That may be you. I can see from some of the names of people online today that there are some really great understanders, intuitive workers with data out there. The problem with people who are really good and really intuitive is they tend to struggle to teach other people how to find the story in the data. Because they are not doing it systematically, or if they are doing it systematically, they don't know they're doing it systematically, it's very hard for them to train others. It's really hard if you have two intuitive people working together for them to come up with a nice coherent picture, because they tend to bump into each other in terms of which order do they want to look at things and how are they going to find things. Frameworks tackles that. It creates a more efficient and reliable process. Now, what are the elements of a framework? First of all, how to frame the problem. Then linking that project into a wider context. It should include a standard method for organizing the data, qualitative and quantitative information, systematic methods for analyzing the data, and a preferred method for extracting the story and linking it to a wider context. There are quite a lot of frameworks out there. You probably want to pick and mix to combine your own, but once you do, you want to stick with it and become, make it embedded in the organization. There is a really, really good book on this topic, published in 2004, The Art and Science of Interpreting Market Research Evidence by David Smith and Jonathan Fletcher. And every time I recommend this book, people say, well, 2004, isn't it out of date? No, not at all, because the process of thinking about information and how to assemble it has not changed in the last 11 years. We've got some extra tools. We've got some extra pieces. The need for this book, however, has changed massively in the last 11 years. Because of big data, because of the data deluge, we have more and more need for things like this. And so I very much urge you to have a look at this book and take some of the advice on how you can create stories and use frameworks. So from data to stories, what I'm gonna run through in the next few minutes is defining the problem, establishing what is currently known, check and organizing the data, finding the message, crafting and telling the story. This process starts when the request for a study emerges. Far too often, I see people bring their information together at the end of fieldwork and say, right, how are we going to analyze this? I don't say to them, it is too late, because obviously you have to do something. But in many ways, it is too late if the fieldwork has finished, because 
you should be looking at this process before the fieldwork starts. You should be monitoring the fieldwork to see if there are any additional probes or questions that you might want to add. Maybe you want to put in an open-ended question into that survey. Maybe after the first two or three focus groups, you want to change things around a bit so that you get some different information and that you can tease out different ideas. So let's start this analysis and frameworks process when the first request or idea for the project starts. In fact, it should be part of the project or study or um, research request process. This is a lovely quote from um, David Smith, Jonathan Fletcher's book, a problem defined is a problem half solved. And they spend a lot of time in the book and I spend a lot of time when I'm working with my clients, really working on what the question is, because usually the question you're first asked is not the real question. So questions like, can we collect NPS data? Yes, but what is it that you're trying to change within your business? Um, people recommend our brand. How many people don't like our brand? How many people are aware of our brand? Yes, but what is it that you want to do? So we need to pursue now, where do we find out what the real problem is? Well, the first place, of course, is the request from the study. If you're an agency, you've got an RFQ, that is a really good place to be looking. If you've already written a proposal and you're at the analysis stage, then have a look at what you promised you were going to do. Because at the stage you won the job, you probably had some insights into what the problem was. So let's go back and look at those. Discussions between the sponsor, the insight team, and the supplier. Every time I talk to client side insight managers, one of the most frequent comments they make is that they're not asked enough questions by their suppliers. And the questions often diminish once the project has been won, as opposed to increasing. The sorts of questions you probably want to be talking about are, what is the background to the project? Why has this project happened now? Why didn't it happen six months ago? Why doesn't it happen next year? Why is it now? What would success look like? This is a, um, a well-known question. Vanessa Rashima at Coca-Cola uses this question all the time. What would success like? If I come to you with an answer, what would it look like? What actions should follow from the research? So if I tell you this, what is it you hope to be able to do afterwards? What sort of things do you want to do after you've answered this question? Because that tells me a lot more about the nature of the, the question, the nature of the problem. What do people think the results are going to be? Or what are the prevalent hypotheses? So when I'm designing research, I want to know what people already believe because we want to prove and disprove those thoughts. When we come to interpret the information, one of the strongest ways of getting insight into what the data means are how the, the results compare with what we expect it to be. I'm conducting a whole series of workshops and research into this topic about learning to find the story in the data. And I'm talking to a lot of leading researchers and I had a great conversation uh, with Steve Nadell about this. And he was highlighting that He's looking to see whether his hypothesis beforehand is confirmed or not. If it's confirmed, he hasn't learned very much, but he knows a lot more about that that definitely is the story. If the hypothesis is not confirmed, it's a fantastic lead into where the story is going to be. So that's why we want to collect those at the outset. We need to establish what is already known. And for those of you who've done anything postgraduate in terms of your academic career, you probably remember the literary review. Market researchers, insight managers should be conducting an equivalent, a cut down version of the literary review. What do we already know on this topic? And let's not just focus on what we're going to collect, the focus groups, the online discussions, the ethnography, the surveys, whatever it is we're doing as part of this project should not be seen as everything we're going to be looking at. We should be looking at a much wider piece of information. We need to look at the analysis, the validity, and the way the story blends research with this wider context. And what is that wider context? Well, it's things known within the organization. 
within the client organization, within the supplier organization. Very standard question. Have you ever run anything like this before or on this topic or in a sim or used this technique on a similar brand? Because if they have, we should be looking at that and building that into the analysis within the agency, within the supplier industry mission specific research about society or about changes or about topics like that and they can use that information to enrich the survey of course there's masses and masses of stuff in the public realm and we should be bringing in that as part of the analysis one of the terrible silos we get into is not the market research silo it's the project silo where we think the answer to the problem will come solely from the project we've just run and that is so limiting. We should be looking at a much wider basis. Now, here is an incredibly simplified um, framework, the sort of thing that you might take and then develop and expand. So who is the project for? What is the business issue problem that's being addressed? What does the business want to do once it has addressed this issue? We, you know, and we need to go back to make sure that we don't simply get platitudes in there but some real action points. What do we already know? We know this, and it's held by this team, and here's some description about what's in it. We know this, it's held by this team, and here's the description of it. And then we get to the assumptions and the predictions. Who thinks this? Who thinks that? Um, and we can move forward on that. Then we're going to assemble the evidence. So first of all, how are we going to assemble the quantitative evidence? First of all, on this slide, it's not first of all in real life. First of all, in real life could also be qualitative. Quantitative, are we going to standardize it so it's comparable? We've got different information from different countries. We've got some passive data collection. We've got some survey responses. Um, we've got some sales data. How are we going to combine all that? What are we going to do with missing data? More and more types of data that market research and insight people are dealing with have missing data. They've got data sparsity. Are we going to index that information on something, particularly if it goes back over time? Are we going to rebase it so it's on some sort of common standard? Qualitative, how are we going to handle the translations? We want to make sure that we don't process the English language data first and then process the non-English data at some later stage, because that can lead to some real biases in the thinking. Um, English is not the richest language America, UK, Australia, Canada are not necessarily the richest cultures. Let's make sure that we've got the translations in place, the transcripts, but also the notes, the notes the moderators have taken. Or if you've devolved out the project to multiple community moderators, online moderators, face-to-face -face moderators, get them to write what they felt people were saying. What, what things was it hard to understand? Which things do they not really think were communicated well? And take that into account as part of the information, part of the data. And then we need to look at those sources. What is the credibility of them? What are the biases? What are the interactions between them? Um, so I was looking at a data set from a large um, mobile phone company recently, and they had fantastic data on about 10 million of their customers where they were, what they did, how they traveled around the country, but they didn't have that data for the pay-as-you-go customers. They only had that data for the contract customers. Now, that data is really useful, but it also has a massive bias and an interaction with other information we're going to use. And we just need to know that and be aware of it. We can't remove everything, but we can be aware. Then we've got to start separating the signal from the noise. And this is going to be a bigger and bigger part as data grows. Nate Selver has written a, a great book on separating the signal from the noise. And one of the points he makes, of course, is that the noise is growing much faster than the signal and harder and harder to do that. So on this particular slide is the answer to the most fundamental question. And we can only see it if we start separating out the data. If we start applying some filters, so here's a color filter, and then we remove it, and we can see the answer is 42 for those of you who follow the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Now, look at that 42 on the screen. I go back, yeah, it's really easy to see it. I go back, even though you know where it is, it's hard to see it. 
So we do need to use better and better techniques and tools, filters and processes to separate the signal from the noise, particularly as the amount of data increases. So just going to look at a couple of things in terms of how we might identify that information, might remove some noise, and we might align data across different periods. So the first is normalizing by share of. So it could be share of wallet, it could be share of throat if we're in soft drinks, um, share of eyeballs, share of watching time, all sorts of things like that, share of travel time. This is a great free resource if you've not used it. It's Google Trends, Google Insights, and it looks at how many times people search for a particular word. So here I've said, okay, from 2004 to the present, worldwide, let's have a look for the for people who were searching for Relenza. Relenza is um, anti-flu drug, and when you look at where those spikes are, what you're going to see are things like SARS and swine flu and so on. So we can see that we've got some interesting data going on. But what does that data mean? Because in 2015 nearly twice as many people are using the internet as in about 2010 and about five times as many as 2004. So how are we going to normalize that data? What Google do is they take the percentages of all searches that day that were Relenza and they ex so they have a set of data which is something like 0.0000001%, 0 0.0000002%. 0 they find the biggest number in that data set and call that 100. And then everything else is indexed from that. So all of a sudden, we have a system which is based on share of searches. It still has some problems. We can talk about that at another time. But that is a good method of normalizing the data. Now, one of the interesting things about that, of course, is a very relative measurement. So if we add in Tamiflu, which is a much better known, more widely talked about um, anti-flu drug, then what we see is that all of those spikes and peaks for Relenza have become very flat. And that is one of the things we need to be always aware of when we're using share of as a measurement. It's a very powerful measurement. We should be using it, but also it is only true within the context of those items that you're doing share of with. We can also normalize our data by coding. So one method that's been very common these days is if we've got open-ended comments, we've got social media comments, is we'll use sentiment analysis. And that could be sentiment analysis done by a person, done by a machine. Most common now, a combination of people and machines. So some machine learning based on human coding to convert into positive sentiment, negative sentiment, and neutral sentiment. That is normalizing by coding. We can digitize from analog signals to binary signals. We can allocate people to segments. So if we take the NPS, the promoters and detractors is allocating into segments. Heavy, medium, light, um, lapsed customers, frequent customers, prospects, all sorts of ways where we can code them into segments. We can score different elements. So. Let's just think about rugby. We're just in the UK. We've had the World Cup of rugby. And rugby scoring is, is really complex. If you touch the ball down over the try line, you get five points. You then get the chance to kick the ball over the sticks. And if you successfully do that, you get another two. You've converted it. And it's gone from five points to seven points. If you get a penalty and you can kick the ball over the sticks, you get three points. If you at any time join the game, drop the ball and do a, a drop kick and it goes over the six that's three points we are eval what the people who run the game have done over time is change the point scoring around to try to get the sort of games they want to do to be able to say that was a good game and that was not such a good game that is what we can do with all sorts of data if we take shopping behavior if we take basket behavior if we take um, in-store behavior all sorts of behaviors we can score those in different ways the sort of things that sales team and people using salesforce are doing all the time intuitively that's another method of normalizing really disparate sorts of data onto a common basis and that's one of the things that we need to do in taking this information forward we can normalize by growth patterns. So if you produce um, new mobile phones, if you produce new devices, whatever it is, 
you can't really compare with the sales of old things. So a very common technique is to say, what is it like for year one, year two, year three? And this is from Forbes, and they're looking at why WhatsApp grew so, uh, was so valuable. Because within four years, its numbers of users grew so much faster than Facebook and Twitter and Skype. So that's a great method of doing it. It's the way that people forecasting cinema takings do it at the end of the first day, the second day. They're pretty sure what those takings are going to be because there are established growth patterns that they need to fit them to. So this is another method that we take data and we can bring it back into a similar pattern. One of the things we absolutely have to do, and I've got a lot of examples in the workshops, so we're just going to have a couple of them here today, is checking your data is right. So first of all, you check it's right for all the obvious things, like is there missing data? Have people not answered this question? Are some of the scales reversed? Um, are there some really odd things that are going on in the focus group transcripts that maybe suggest that this didn't work quite well in, the, in that country if they misinterpreted what something was. So we do all of that quality control, but then we need to make sure that we're not seeing patterns where they're not there. This is more and more going to be a problem as data grows. So here's a, an example from the past. Back in 1976, Viking was launched on its way past Mars. It took this photograph. It led to lots and lots of theories of intelligent lines. Say, oh, look, somebody must have carved that. That's a statue. Um, so much so that Viking 2 had its route changed to be able to take a picture of this from another angle to say, no, 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 that is actually just a naturally occurring phenomenon. Our eyes are seeing a pattern, but there isn't a pattern there. It's the flip side of all this behavioral economics where they show you some few patterns and we can make great sense out of them. We can. We can also make sense out of things that don't exist. Um, there's a fun website out there now which comes up with lots and lots of spurious correlations. And here's a great example. Worldwide non-commercial space launches, sociology doctorates awarded. If you have some reason for believing A and B are interacting, and then when you measure them, there's a correlation, that is support. If you simply find that two items in your data have a correlation, all that tells you is maybe you should look at it because maybe there's something, but probably there isn't. Um, and we are going to get more and more spurious correlations as we move forward with more and more data. This is a nice example of mixing up causality and really not thinking about the nature of your data. So a few years back, there were several studies that showed women taking hormone replacement therapy were less likely to suffer from coronary heart disease. And this led to quite a few articles from some leading doctors, and they proposed that hormone replacement therapy was protecting women against coronary heart disease. So actually, there might be a reason to increase the number of women taking HRT um, as a defense mechanism. Randomized controlled tests showed that HRT created a slight increase in risk. So a randomized control test, um, you, you double blind, the doctors doing the prescribing don't know if they're prescribing a dummy or the real thing. The patients don't know if they're getting a dummy or the real thing. We now have an experiment and we find out that HRT slightly increases the risk. Huh? How could that happen? Because there's lots and lots of real world data, not experimental data, real world data that said that the women who were receiving HRT had less, fewer cases of CHD, coronary heart disease. Look at the data and the women taking hormone replacement therapy were typically from higher income groups. They were from healthier members of society and those groups have lower rates of CHD. It wasn't because of the HRT. These two phenomena, being likely to prescribe HRT and being likely to have lower rates of coronary heart disease, were correlated, not cause and effect. And these are the sort of things that we're going to have to be looking at all the time in our data and as we do that analysis. Embedding frameworks. So we've got our frameworks, we've got our systems, we've got our standardized ways. You need to establish the framework for your company. You need to share it with your colleagues. You need to share it with suppliers. And I was running a workshop recently and uh, 
the insight manager there had one of those slap hand on head moments because they've got a framework and they're doing quite nicely with it. And it was shared within the organization. But actually, they had never shared their analysis framework with their suppliers, which meant the suppliers were not delivering the outputs in the optimal way to be part of that framework. So you absolutely want to be designing your projects with that. You want to be telling your suppliers, this is why we are using this format. This is how we're using this format. Please help us with it. Please annotate this information. Add metadata to this information. So all of that is the structure we put in place that's going to help us find the story. We're going to know what the question is. We're going to have an idea of what success looks like. Then we're going to find the big story in the data. What do most people do? Why do most people do it? We need to find out what that big story is before we do anything else. Then we look for the relevant exceptions. And relevant is massively important here. We are trying to help somebody make a better business decision. Relevant relates to that better business decision. So there will be lots and lots of interesting things in the data, but they may not be relevant to that business decision. So we find the big story and then we look for the relevant exceptions. Then we determine how the message in the data answers the business question and we craft the story. So let's look at that issue about finding the total picture first, the big story. In quant, it means basically looking at the totals column. It means looking for big numbers and big patterns. Um, statistical significance really shouldn't enter into it, provided your sample size isn't trivial, because you're looking for really big differences, not the things where you can say, oh, well, it, it is significant at the 99% level. If it's not a big number, you're not interested in it at this stage. That's going to tell you about the big picture. That's going to frame the detail. In qual, you're going to have to read the transcripts. Unless you personally conducted all of the work, if you ran all of those online discussions, if you um, monitored that ethnography, mobile ethnography project all the time personally, fine. If not, you need to read the notes, you need to read the transcripts until you realize you're not learning anything new that's big, which is what um, an early point of within saturated analysis. You want to create notes and memos as you go through so you can go back and refer to them and find out what these main themes are. What are the big themes that connect the information? Always in the context of the business question. So this is what I see a lot of the times with junior researchers who've been hired and they've not had enough time spent on them with training and so on. They will get a set of cross tabs like this. And this was a project that was looking at where does the best market research come from? So we had respondents from all around the world um, and we were analyzing it. And what I see people do is they highlight, oh, there's a 92 on the top row. So the research buyers really strongly think it's the UK. And if we go down the academics, well, 60% of them think it's Germany, which is really different from the other columns. And they're all the time looking to see which columns are different. They're circling the numbers. We'll go down the supplies, the research industry. 15% of them think Japan is the best place. And well, look at that. That's much higher than the other types of people we're researching. That is absolutely the wrong approach to finding the big story from how you start the project. How you start the project is you're just looking at the totals column. But let's look at that graphically. All of a sudden, the big story comes off the page. Two countries, UK and USA, are a long, long way ahead of everybody else. Why is that? So the next step after we've identified, well, that's the big story in the data. Why are they so different? Is it true for everybody? So the first thing we did, which we analyzed this data after we found this big story, is we said, well, maybe English speakers who were about half the respondents voted for the English speaking countries and the non-English speaking people maybe were less true. We ran that analysis. Actually, no, it was true for both sets. It was true for every group of countries. So that was a really important finding that this is a a generalized belief amongst the people in this sample. Now, the next question we would ask, of course, is are the sample representative? Is this true for everybody? And then what are the implications of this? 
But the implications of this are different for Japan than they are for the UK. So if my business customer is the Japan Market Research Association, we're looking at how we would go about tackling that. If we were talking to the UK Market Research Association, we'd be looking at how we leverage that to make better use and advantage of it. I think there's a really interesting difference when you're analyzing data between the cartographer, the map maker, and the journalist. So here is a map, and the map maker does not know how the data is going to be used. So every point on this map is done with equal care and equal attention, and it all has to be set out properly. So if you're setting out a book of tables for somebody else, then you've got to take care on every point of those information. So that is like the cartographer. Now, there's an interesting point on here. Uh, right there in the middle, we have the White House. Now, every bit of that map is not equally important. The White House is a really important place. And we can contrast the cartographer's view of that with Bernstein and Woodward, all the president's men, when they did not report everything that Nixon did. They didn't look at what he had for breakfast. They didn't look at what he did in terms of trade and opening up the relationship with China. They looked at one issue and they followed the money. Um, and as researchers, we need to think about follow the money. And the money in this context for researchers is what is it that's going to make a difference to the business decision? Another example um, from somebody who started as a journalist, went on to be um, author and screenwriter Nora Ephron, amongst the things she wrote, When Harry Meant Sally and Sleepless in Seattle. She was born in the right sort of uh, part of America. She went to journalism school in Beverly Hills. And on her first day there, she tells the tale of how she learned the five W's, who, what, when, where, and why. Really good principles. And at the end of the day, the lecturer said, OK, I want you to write the lead for the school newspaper. Now, the lead is the top piece that's going to make you want to read everything. Think about that in terms of an insight finding. It's the top piece that's going to make you want to read everything. And so they were asked to write the lead for the school newspaper. And they said, here's the, the story. The entire school faculty will travel to Sacramento next Thursday for a colloquium in among the speakers will be anthropologist Margaret Mead, college president Dr. Robert Maynard Hutchins, and California government Edmund Brown. Edmund Brown. So all the students typed away, and there was a tremendous clatter because those days we didn't have electric typewriters. They were the old manual ones. Clatter, clatter, clatter. The students tended to fall back on the five Ws. And the lecturer looked at them all and said, well, they're good, but none of them are right. So what was the real lead? No school next Thursday. They were writing for the school newspaper for the students. The whole faculty are going to Sacramento. Sometimes the main story in the data is not in the data. It's of the data. It's because of the data. It's the implication. And this is such a strong story. Um, Nora Ephron told it frequently. It appears in many, many of the books around storytelling and thinking. You've really got to identify what the core message is. What is the lead? And that lead is something that is really relevant to the readership, to the audience, to the insight manager, to the brand manager, to the CEO, whatever that audience is going to be. It's going to have an impact on their life based on the outcome of this study of this information. Now, on the left here, there's a picture that many of you all seen. And we need to think about different perspectives. So you can see that as a, as a young lady with a feather in her hair. You can see it as an old lady. And you really need to think about what you do when you see it as one way and the other way. And while I'm talking, just think about how you do that, how you go from seeing it as an old lady to seeing as a young lady. For anyone who's having a problem, that's the nose there of the young lady. That's the mouth of the old lady. That's the chin of the old lady. That's the nose of the old lady. That's the ear of the young lady. So we can see that picture backwards and forwards. We need to look at the data from a qualitative perspective and a quantitative perspective and move backwards and forwards. But we also need to look at it from different perspectives perceptions of the 
customers, the brand managers, the NPD team, all of them will have different perspectives and we need to see how the picture looks. And I had a great example of this. Last week, I was catching a train to London on a Sunday afternoon, Sunday morning, sorry. Um, it's about a two hour journey from Nottingham to London. The train starts in Nottingham. And in the next carriage to me are, are four um, middle-aged people, let's say very slightly younger than me, um, who are the British moaning sort, if you know what I mean. And they're having a bit of a moan about the station and then they have a little bit of a moan about the announcements because the announcements are very long before the train sets off. And we set off on this two hour journey and after about three minutes, the train starts to slow down because we're going to stop at another station in the suburbs of Nottingham, the station of Beeston. And they start, why are we stopping here? I can't see. Why would anybody catch the train to go to Beeston if it's a London train? Because, you know, it's going all the way to London. Why would you catch that sort of train just to travel four or five minutes down the line? And sure enough, when the train stops at Beeston, nobody gets off. But a lot of people get on because... This is one of the places you get on the train to London. These four people were looking in wholly from their point of view. Why would the train stop for people like us to get off? It's not for people like you. It's for other people. And we all fall into that trap. Me, you, everybody. When we look at information too often, we don't take the perspectives of different people. If we're trying to understand why people do do something, if we're trying to understand why they don't do something, then we need to think ourselves into new, new mindsets. When we're trying to understand why somebody doesn't buy the cheapest option, when we're trying to understand why somebody doesn't replace something before it breaks, we need to identify those different perspectives. There's also a very tenuous link between finding the story and telling the story. In finding the story, we've got these multiple data sources with different degrees of confidence in those sources. And maybe we've done a study um, about some new treatments and we've interviewed a whole bunch of consulting surgeons. And actually, the best piece of data we've got is a conjoint study with consulting surgeons. And we've looked at that and we really understand now the study and we've looked at lots of other pieces it triangulates well um, it's coherent it has the right sort of message now we have to tell that story frankly for most audiences conjoint is a really boring way of telling the story so maybe we're going to use a vox pop video with one patient talking about their experience now that vox pop could be a really bad way of finding the story we can often be seduced by really funny videos or interesting videos. So they're not often good ways of finding the story, but they can be immensely good ways to tell the story. There is no requirement for the way you tell the story to be based on the process that you went through to find the story. So what are the key findings? Link them to the project objectives. Obviously, need to know, not nice to know. Supported by patterns or themes in the data. One of the risks is if you pluck out an individual comment or an individual finding, that can be really dangerous. Look at that, that web, that network of past studies, of future studies, of expectations to see whether or not it fits a pattern. It needs to be clear findings. So in that chart, the UK and the USA were a long way ahead in terms of best research. Things like well, 16% of our customers are under 25, but 17% of their customers are. So that is a difference. It's a difference, but it's usually not very useful. You want to be looking normally at numbers that are bigger than 50% to be worth mentioning, which often means reorganizing your data, reorganizing your thinking, loosening some of the boundaries to make them strong and positive. Now, there's a link on this video. I publicized the link beforehand. So I hope a few of you have actually seen the whole video. It's about four minutes and I really, really recommend it. One of the best ways to understand how to tell stories about data is to watch Hans Rosling videos. There's a whole stack of them on TED and I, I recommend them. And there are some other videos which are not on TED, which includes this one. This is uh, done with a TV company. It's about four minutes long. And in the workshop situation, we show 
the video, but first of all, we, I asked them to think about what is his key message? What is the story and what has he left out? And during his four minutes, he puts up this virtual grid. He shows that all of the countries um, in 1800 were all the way in that bottom left corner, which he calls poor and sick. And then he shows how the Western companies with the Industrial Revolution, Western countries with the Industrial Revolution got wealthier and healthier and they moved up to the top and then he showed how during the last 50 years um, most of the other countries in the world have also come there and he shows um, how AIDS held back these particular countries and so on and he shows what the position at the end and so the group watches that and I hope you will watch it and watch that for four minutes thinking now what's his key message what is the story and what is he left out so if we look at that process. His key message is that it's possible to tackle world health problems. He barely mentions the key message, but he builds an implacable argument in favor of it. The key story, 200 years ago, short life expectancy was the norm. Then the West moved ahead. But over the last 50 years, most countries have caught up. Across multiple Hans Rosling videos, you'll see there is another message, which is most people in the West do not understand that the world has changed. We are thinking with a 40 and 50 year old mindset about us and them, and the world has changed fairly fundamentally. And then his second part of this key story is there are still some countries still behind and some regions of other countries. But since most of the world has been solved, the rest can be. And he shows a great example about how comparable Shanghai and Italy are, for example. His key narrative access is the 200 years from 1810, and it's also about bad to good. So there is a clear direction. Most of the times when you are crafting a story from the data for your audience, you do not want to plot that twists and turns and goes backwards. It's, this should not be like Pulp Fiction with flashbacks and jump forwards. Your story should be the good old fashioned beginning, middle and end. So what did he leave out of that presentation? Because understanding what people have left out is an, a really good way of finding out about the story making process. He left out numbers. If you look at that, you will see that he mentioned a handful of dates, about four or five, three life expectancies, three income levels. It was based on 200 countries. And he mentions at the end of the presentation, 120,000 numbers. He knows that numbers do not tell the picture. He has to craft a story and he uses um, bubbles and dynamic uh, visualization, but he doesn't use numbers. He uses numbers to find the story, but not to tell the story. Definitions, which 200 countries? If you go back to 1810, a lot of the countries that exist to now didn't exist then. Boundaries have changed. Boundaries continue to change. Are we going to put Crimea in Russia or Ukraine? That will change over the next few years. So he's tackled all of those, but he's not talked about them because they're not the story. If he was presenting a study to analysts or epidemiologists about how do you do this, they would be the story. But here they are not the story, so they're not in the presentation. There are, in the Gapminder, which is the system he uses for his data sets, there are 519 key global stats. He's taken the two that are useful. I dare say that he looked at hundreds of others, but he identified the two that told the story best, and those are the ones that he used. Sometimes those insights can become really, really straightforward. So many of you will have seen a series of ads for the Snickers chocolate bar. You're not you when you're hungry. Um, different executions in different parts of the world. That came from a very, very simple um, insight story out of the data. People behave differently when they're hungry or people believe people behave differently when they're hungry, which is a more important uh, point about that. And Snickers is credible. It's big enough to have that end the hunger, probably building a little bit on the historical background of Mars a day helps you work, rest and play. Actually, it's a similar size, similar color. It's going to it's got nuts in it, for heaven's sake. That is then taken global campaigns, local executions and generates a sales increase. That sales increase 
is the business need. We need to find new reasons for people to buy Snickers so that we will have a sales increase. That is what the fundamental question was. And from the insight that came out of that data is here is a story that can give you new entries, new situations that are salient to your brand. That's how we would pull that sort of information together. So developing your narrative theme, you've got to select the primary axis. What is that core bit of the story? And that's the elevator pitch. If you've only got 60 seconds, that's the story. Use a structure that works with the audience. And this is an important consideration for anybody who worked in global research. There is no one best story. So typically in a USA, you would say the main finding was X, so we recommend Y and Z. Now let's tell you why it's X and why it's Y and Z. But it's different in different places. If you are doing a project in Japan with a Japanese client, you are probably going to start the presentation with, you asked us to look at this. So we did the following. While we were doing the following, these sort of things happened and we discovered this and we are going to build and a fashion. So all the time you're trying to work out what for this audience, what do I need them to do, think and feel? Big picture of what I said today, develop a framework. Define the problem before you try to find the answer to it. Put the research project into the context of what is already known. And when you are crafting the story, decide what you want the audience, the person you are presenting to, to think, to feel, and to do. You can't do a good story. You can't make a good presentation unless you know what you want the client to think afterwards. That's the factual stuff feel afterwards because that is what is going to make the do happen so you need to get all three of those lined up in order to be able to make your storytelling something that's going to cause impact at the end of the process because we don't want a reputation as somebody who tells great stories but they don't go anywhere we want a reputation of people who use storytelling to make action happen Thank you very much. Um, I urge you to do one of or both of those two. And we're now going to open the floor to questions.